Let's go to the Brian Foley Law Hotline. That's where we find Tom Hart here on Texags Radio, SEC Network, ESPN. Great. What's up, Tom? Good morning, buddy. Good morning. I just want to know how you feel today. I feel like, great. What, what, is, what are your feelings at this moment? Look, uh, I, I really like Jimbo. I think it should have worked with Jimbo. It was time. Yeah. It was time. I would say it was time before the, uh, the aftermath of the Ole Miss game. I wanted to believe. I wanted to believe in the offseason, even though there was a part of me that's like, I don't know if this is ever going to work, man. This is like, but when he went out and said, I'm going to get an offense coordinator, I wanted to believe it was going to work. By the Tennessee game this year, even though they had lost quarterback after quarterback, I, at this point, I was like, I don't think it's ever going to work. Um, and I probably knew before, but there was, I was holding on to hope. I wish him well. I liked him. He treated me very, uh, with a lot of respect, but this program cannot be as to, to borrow a line from Ross Bjork yesterday, stuck in neutral. And that's what they've been for the last, since I got here. Maybe it's my fault, but since I got to Texas, <laughs> this program has been stuck in neutral. Uh, the former Florida athletic director, Jeremy Foley, had a great line that he used when it came to making changes. And it was, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines of, and maybe, maybe he stole this from a Greek philosopher. But what must be done eventually should be done immediately, right? Once it becomes clear that this isn't the right guy to lead your program, there's no sense in waiting. Even if it saves you five, ten million dollars over the next season, if he's not the right guy, you got to cut bait and move on. Um, so I commend A and M for making that move and for moving on. I thought it was evident last year. It wasn't just the losing streak. It was the vibe around the program. Um, toxic would be too strong a word, but it was discombobulated. Mm -hmm. And uh, people have asked me since the, the change, well, what, why hasn't A&M won? Like, what got in their way? And I think the answer is pretty simple. I think it's Jimbo. I think this, this hiring, in hindsight, and uh, it's all 2020 in hindsight uh, was very similar to like a, an aging slugger getting that big mega free agent deal. You know, it's Albert Pujols to the angels. You're paying a guy based on what he did with hope that he's going to recreate it. But his offense was archaic. His quarterback coaching was a great fit 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and the game has changed. So uh, I think that was a, eventually and and probably immediately what got in the way of the program having success. Yeah, obviously you can't argue against the recruiting. The recruiting was top notch. It was fantastic. And he deserves a lot of credit for that. But the execution on game day um, and the, the, the kind of vibe around the program, all of that got in the way and turned into a roadblock. So with my Aggie glasses on, I agree with everything you said there. The thing that I think okay, good. made me stay a little bit more optimistic, which was ended up biting us in the butt, was these these games were all tight. Look, did they just make th like that was my thing this summer? If they just make one more offensive play a game, they're gonna, which is true. Except when it's two years in a row of if they make one more like all the, when you find ways to lose games every time, different ways, special teams touchdown, dumb interception at the end, block field goal. We can go through it. Can't get a yard against App State. When that becomes the theme, then it's time to move on. Well, and to your point, it's why are we a play away? Why are we constantly a play away? By the way, you should never be a play away against Appalachian State or that Auburn program last year um, or even Ole Miss last year. Like Based on where this program is, what's expected, what's invested in it, to be multiple plays ahead of those programs. Uh, but I think... I remember going into the Auburn game last year and what was all of the discussion going in? It was whether or not the, and, and throughout that game, are the wide receivers allowed to wear sleeves or not? This is what it's boiled down to. Like these are the distractions that you've allowed to infiltrate your walls is whether or not your five-star wide receivers who, by the way, you need to be successful and you need to be the right frame of mind. And well, listen, we know that, uh, wide receivers historically are very fragile divas, right? They put them in a glass case, handle them properly. They're the key to your success. And we're worried about whether or not they can wear sleeves and what our team rules are against that. Um, that's the kind of stuff I think that eventually got in the way. It's not making the main thing the main thing, which is 
go out and win games. Um, now, I will say this. We did the Jimbo's first game against Northwestern State, and there was so much excitement around the program. And the message at the time was, this deserves to be a national program. And I thought his sights being set on some big picture items were commendable at the time. I mean, we spent 10 minutes talking about his desire to convince Delta to add a direct flight from Atlanta into Easterwood, right? I, okay, that's the kind of big picture thinking a CEO should, should go for. Um, but in the end, like, let's worry about what's happening on the field. And I'll even go back to the, that previous spring. I was doing a baseball game. I showed up uh, for spring practice. Andy Staples was with me on the sideline. We're just watching ball. And, and Jimbo came in with a discipline that was so extreme that he kicked a kid out of practice that day and he gathered the team at the end of practice and he promised all of them that if they didn't want to be there, he'd have papers waiting on his desk and they could go wherever they wanted. And if that was Baton Rouge or Tuscaloosa or Austin, he would sign the papers right then, but they had to understand that it's his way. It, he wasn't going to let fly what, what went in, in the previous coaching regime. And I was really, really impressed. I thought he was bringing a level of discipline into that program that needed to be there coming off the Sumlin air. But none of that, none of that added up. And in the end, you got to win games. And when you, you go buy a Maserati or a Porsche or a Mercedes, you expect that level of quality that you're paying for, uh, you don't want to leave the leave the lot in a in a junker. And I thought last year was probably pretty good, uh, pretty good example of that. What do you say to those who are like, it's not totally on Jimbo. I mean, he's lost his starting quarterback and his backup quarterback the last three years. I mean, how how good is LSU going to be without Jaden Daniels? You know, wh- when that comes up, how do you respond? Well. I'll give them this. Depth is more of a concern in college football than it's ever been. Those second string guys, the quarterback position has always been guys looking for playing time and finding value in playing time. But even outside of that position, those guys that historically would be patient to sit and wait in a program, whether that be A&M or Alabama or USC, have now said, I can go down the road to a lesser school, get immediate playing time. And no, oh, by the way, they're going to pay me. You know, I'm going to get some NIL money to go down there and be a starter as opposed to being a backup here. So I think that's real, the lack of depth in college football, because talent has been more dispersed than ever before. Um, that being said, for one year, sure. But if your reputation and your paycheck is built on you being an offensive mastermind and a quarterback guru, then you need to have elite play there four out of five years. I'm elite. And uh, we know that's what it takes to win in college football these days. Look what look where Alabama is now with Jalen Milrow versus where they were in the month of September. Um, that's a huge difference. And th- he was getting paid to not just recruit, but also develop five-star quarterbacks, and that didn't happen. All right, so Tom Hart gets to play athletic director. He gets to play Ross Bjork right now. Who, who's on your short list of, of guys that A&M has to try to get? Well, first of all, I'd be excited to give that a try because Ross has an incredible wardrobe and I want to try on those blazers <laughs> and see if they fit because they always look good on them. Um, and I know he rocks the blue Delta jeans. I, the, my first phone call is to Seattle and to Kalen DeBoer. Um, we had their bowl game last year in San Antonio against Texas. Uh, I covered him when he was at Indiana prior to that. I think he is a, an elite mind when it comes to coaching. Uh, his organizational skills are through the roof. He relates to players. He's got an incredible staff, and it's a staff that wants to work for him and be with him. And I I think that's really important that you don't get that everywhere. Um, At the time, he he, there was no way he was going to leave Washington. I mean, they've built something special. I I know it's usually off people's radar. Um, And he had a great AD. Well, she has since left. He's got a new athletic director. Um, And the staff is paid handsomely. His coordinators make a ton of money. But I would absolutely call Kalen DeBoer and try to convince him to give A&M a look and and to convince him that he can reach heights uh, at A&M that aren't possible uh, in Seattle or even going forward when Washington goes into the Big Ten and and all of the travel issues and recruiting issues they're going to have to deal with as a side. Um, Obviously, Mike Elko knows what it's like to be there. I wonder if – I think Elko is – obviously ready 
for a big job, but he's also proven that he'll say no to other jobs. Like he had a chance to take the Temple head coaching job before he came to A&M, uh, or maybe it was after his first year. I forget. I think it was before he came there. And it wasn't the right fit for him. And so he's obviously very pragmatic. Most assistant coaches would have jumped at that opportunity to be a head coach for the first time. But I think he's very pragmatic about what his next steps will be and where he has the best chance to win. So I don't know if – I'm just spitballing here. I don't know if A&M is the perfect job for Mike Elko in Elko's mind. Uh, but I would absolutely call him. I think he's a great defensive mind, and he knows the challenges of being at A&M and uh, he knows what recruiting is like. Uh, I don't think Dan Lanning is going to come. I think the buyout is uh, too steep, especially when you're talking about, you know, being 80 million down to get this staff out the door. But I think you just swing for the fences, man. I think, I think it, it's once again, it is an elite job based on the resources there, both financially and, and from a recruiting standpoint. What got in the way of A&M over the last five years, which is really when it became an elite job, was the guy in the corner office. I mean, that, that's what got in the way. That, is, that, is, that obstruction's gone. So I think a lot of coaches need to look at this and say, that there's a place I can go in and compete for national championships. Tom, how ironic is it that the weekend Jimbo gets fired is the weekend that everything worked like, right? Like other than the first special teams play, right? Kick return for a touchdown. Jalen Henderson, third string quarterback, looks like a freaking stud out there. Just the moxie and just the throws and the offense was simplified. The offensive line blocked. They were able to run defense, forcing turnovers, getting after the quarterback like they've done all year long. Everything seemed to work on the weekend that Jimbo was let go. Is this the first time in history, or at least Power Five history, that both head coaches in the same game were let go after that game? Might be. I mean, that's, and I think by saying that, what I'm, what I'm saying here is that it take, it take it into consideration the opponent, right? Um, Mississippi State is a disaster right now. Uh, they're a shell of a program, uh, which is why they felt like they had to make the move with Arnett and, and get in on some good candidates early. Um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate the decision making, though. I mean, obviously, this was this was figured out before that game, and you look forward to what's to come. The, the LSU series, as great as Jaden Daniels is, um, and I think he, he's my he's got my number one Heisman vote right now, especially watching him in person Saturday night. That LSU defense is abhorrent; it is god awful, and we know the history of LSU A and M. Anything can happen in that game, right? So I think. I think Ross acted expediently, recognizing not only the timing of the board of trustees meeting, but also what if we don't make this move? You know, what if we don't make this move? And he he w- wins a couple games to close things out, and recruiting continues to be good. And then you go, well, are we just kicking the can down the road? So yeah, once again, if it's to be done eventually, it must be done immediately. Look, A and M's in a weird spot. Um, this hire is going to be huge, but for the players that are yeah. on the on the roster right now, how important is it for Elijah Robinson to get them to win? You know, two, three games down the stretch. I mean, they, everybody expects them to beat Abilene Christian, but with what is here and what the next coach might have. And by the way, Elijah Robinson might be a candidate as well. It's the most impossible job in sports. What's left of a coaching staff in this scenario? Um, because not only are you dead man walking, but you're expected to continue. Uh, some guys obviously want to be kept on by the next staff. And so they're going to work towards that goal. They're going to continue to recruit, which I've never really understood, but all staffs do it. Um, Ed Ogeron, you know, I'm just thinking back to when he was let go. He was out grinding and still making recruiting trips and going on the road, even though he had been let go. And I, I asked him, I said, dude, what are you, what are you doing? Why? And um, he said, listen, uh, I, I, this is my job. This is what I'm getting paid to do. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish out, you know, what, what they're paying me for, um, part of that responsibility. I think back to what Auburn had last year with uh, Cadillac Williams. They had a guy who bled Auburn. He was, um, his heart was in the right place and the players loved him. And that didn't just resonate in the locker room. And he didn't just get the guys to play. It resonated with the fan base as well. And I think that's what's that's what's available and what's out in front of you is not only do you have, you know, a home game against Abilene Christian where you can come out and just go ball with no pressure. But then 
Like you got an opportunity against LSU and you got an opportunity to play with emotion and to, and to prove people wrong and to say, listen, we're an elite program. And that motivation uh, is not just a game day motivation. The challenge there is each and every day in practice and with all the other stuff that are on these kids plate, whether that be schoolwork or coaches plate when it comes to recruiting. It, this is a real grind now over the last couple of weeks of the regular season for those guys. Were you surprised they made the move like this weekend or this season? Yeah, I was. It, it, it caught me by surprise. And I was going to ask you or Billy about that. Like, how far out did anybody see this coming? Um, I thought if a move wasn't made after last season and, and just kind of the the aura around the program last year was not good, and we had multiple games down the stretch, um, including that Ole Miss game at A&M, which I, I thought was a, in a really bad spot before that Ole Miss game, really bad. Um, and then the Auburn game a couple of weeks later, um, I thought they were all in. I, I thought the board of trustees and the donors and the people who uh, you know, are invested in this program at that level, right? And, and by the way, it should be noted that Investment in the program comes from all levels. It, it comes from the 12th man. It comes from the people writing those big checks. But there are a lot of stakeholders when it comes to college football programs and especially A&M. And we shouldn't ignore the voices or mute the voices of those that, you know, buy season tickets or come to one game a year or, or otherwise support, support the program. Uh, but knowing Ross's aggressiveness, oh, look at the baseball hire. Look at, the, you know, going after Jim Schlossnagel and getting a guy who wants to be in the toughest league in the country and go out there and battle for national championships and go to Omaha year after year, leaving a place where he was perfectly happy and content at TCU. Um, I think that aggressiveness is something that could pay off in this coaching hire. Tom, I, I, I think for me, and I don't want to steal too much from what Billy has said, because I, I think it's we're on the similar wavelength, but the, the Ole Miss game, like, it's embarrassing, man. Like, as well, at one point I was very proud of him, right? But that's the price of admission yeah. to me. Like you got to play hard. Like I play tic tac toe. I've tried to win. Like I don't care if I'm playing a four year old or not. Like everything that that's how I expect my athletes to compete. But they did play hard for Jimbo. There's no doubt about that. But you lose to Ole Miss in a game that could have been a blowout, and you fight all the way back. And then all the same reasons you've lost other games against a guy that had embarrassed your program on multiple occasions, talked bad to your players, talked bad about your head coach, about your traditions. And then you've gotten what last uh, lost your last five Mississippi schools and um, zero and nine on the road and can't beat a ranked team on the road. All that stuff to me, the vibe and th those people who make decisions. And this is a Billy line here. I'm stealing this one from Billy. They're fans too, right? Eventually, yeah, we get fed yeah. up. And I wanted to believe it was going to turn around because they did have Connor Wigman, right? But. They had Connor Wegman coming into this season. Waiting one more year was no guarantee in this new world of college football with anybody on this roster. David, my biggest question going forward, and I appreciate that, and, and, and what you just said about the big money donors being fans, I don't know that that's always a good thing because I, I don't think, and I think presidents are fans too. Right. Very rare is the president who acts pragmatically when it comes to coaching decisions. Most of them act and react emotionally because of the influence of their social circle and the money people who have influence on the program. Um, I've heard many a story of presidents, you know, getting getting schooled by agents and, and could have gotten a guy for X and they at the last second get scared and they throw twice as much at him to try and convince him to be their head coach or to stick around or whatever that might be. Um, so all of that I think is, is valid. The other part of it is what is the timing of this hire and how quickly do you act? Because I, th you know, we've seen guys leave programs before the end of their season. Um, Brian Kelly left before Notre Dame went to the postseason. Uh, I, I thought that was a trend. And I'm thinking back, uh, the guy who took the Texas Tech job left his previous stop um, before the end of the season. I don't think that's good for the business. I don't think it's good for the game. Um, but the type of coaches that A&M is going to go after are the coaches that are going to be playing at the very least um, on conference championship weekend, if not leading teams that are either in the playoff or, or borderline playoffs. So, I think you the, the timing would be find the right guy and let NIL help you out when it comes to uh, when it comes to recruiting 
and let the portal help you out when it comes to recruiting because I don't think you want to make a five-year mistake because of a five-week window. It, take your time. Make sure you get the right guy. Don't rush into this thing because you're afraid of what's going to happen with this class of players. Tom, I appreciate you, sir. Thanks so much. David, thanks. Great to see you. Better times ahead. Yes, sir. Appreciate your time, man. Talk to you soon.